Hello and welcome to another Watch Pro original interview and today we're heading over to Los Angeles to, to meet with Paul Altieri. He's the uh, chief executive of Bob's Watches which has become one of the world's largest and most successful traders of, uh, of pre-owned luxury watches, predominantly Rolex but I know he's branching out more and more into, into some of those other other uh, red, red hot brands at the moment and we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, an auction that he's uh, just just opened yesterday and I think runs for about a, another week but also how the business in general has been going through through the pandemic and uh, and how the pre-owned space um, is finding its feet within the sort of wider ecosystem of the of the global luxury watch industry so i'll say he hello to you paul good to, good to see you again and uh, how, how are things going for you hey rob how are you good morning here and good evening to you in london uh happy to be on the call here with you things are going well um happy to do this with you and stay in tune and get my thoughts on on what's going on here in the states talk a little bit about the auction and uh anything else but i appreciate it appreciate the time and uh it's always good to connect. Uh, uh, absolutely. So, so tell me. I mean, it seems to me that through mo through the pandemic, it seems to be obviously the e-commerce businesses have been performing best, and that includes omni-channel retailers like a Torno or Watch of Switzerland or 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 a Bucra. They've seen their uh, Signet, in fact, reported today. E-commerce sales are up, while uh, obviously brick and mortar sales are pretty much zero while the while the lockdown has been in place give me uh you know your experience of of, of how it's been in the last uh, two three months well you know i think um what we've all experienced pretty much across almost all industries is this gradual transformation to e-commerce and online and you know that's been going on for the last five ten years but no one i don't believe could have seen this potential pandemic coming along and sort of accelerating that that movement online and unfortunately a lot of businesses were caught off guard i think we all were pretty much and i feel bad for a lot of the brick and mortar traditional retailers that, that have been caught up in this closure this worldwide global closure of, of business i don't believe this has ever happened uh hopefully it doesn't happen again uh, but it's been very traumatic on, the, on those businesses that are uh, reliant 100% on walk-in traffic, malls, stores, retail establishments, etc. Some, as you mentioned, had an e-commerce presence and an online business that they could fall back on to help mitigate or offset some of those losses. And I think those are the ones that have sort of been able to survive and make it through. Uh, but some of the other traditional, you know, brick-and-mortar retail sales uh, channels only, I think have been the most affected. Um, we, we've been, we're almost 100% online. So as this thing started, you know, transforming and the pandemic started rolling in uh, second week of the third week of March, we were all caught by surprise. And we were worried and scared just like everybody else. You know, how's it gonna affect sales? How is it gonna affect our operation? You know, what's gonna happen? How long is it gonna, take to you know get through this uh here we are almost three months later now uh and it's been uh, it's been tough it's been a very challenging environment mostly for just traditional brick and mortar but for everybody in business and we're all just looking to get through it and open back up and uh get things back to normal as quickly as possible and did, did you manage to to keep your whole team working working from home or c coming into offices and shifts and that sort of thing or did you have to really cut cut everything to the bone just to make sure that you preserve cash yeah <laughs> it was tough the first couple of weeks and then uh, second third fourth week of march uh it was tough it was scary sales dropped 30 to 40 percent almost immediately people were kind of just in a uh, a frozen state no one knew what to do of course sales sales dropped as i just said uh, but we went down to a skeleton crew because one thing we learned real quickly is there's no off switch on the internet, there's no off switch. You just can't turn your website off. And so FedEx kept running, watches were still coming in, orders were coming in that needed to go out. We needed to have a crew. We couldn't just 
shut down. So we immediately enacted uh, some safety measures. Uh, masks were immediately put in place. We got a very skeleton crew. Everybody that we could put on an, an off off-site remote environment, we did immediately. So we had a very tiny crew here that could get watches in. The accounting team was still here. So we were able to get through it, luckily. And now we've got the whole team back, which is great. About two weeks ago, we brought everybody back. And so it's good to have things back to normal. We still are not 100% normal because we have you know, safety measures in place. We take people's temperatures when they come to work uh, every morning. Uh, we've got you know, masks everywhere we're needed. We still have not opened up the lobby, the retail lobbies for walk-in traffic. Uh, we don't anticipate doing that probably until late June, maybe July. So we'll, we're not quite back to 100% normal, uh, but we're looking forward to that day when it comes. And it seems like, um, a, along with e-commerce, another part of the uh, the business, the auction business, seems to have done fairly well. And you know, even the the big the big four auction houses switching to smaller online timed timed auctions and when you look at the results of the watches that they're selling i mean the, the prices are, are firm they're strong are you and uh, i know that you're uh, keen on auctions you started doing them i think last year or maybe the the year before um how, how significant do you think that is yeah it's going real well rob uh, about three years ago we we took the position we thought that it was a, a, a great platform and a, a great way for us to liquidate, sell, and offer watches to the public, as opposed to putting them on the site with a preset uh, price, um, which may or may not be market. <clears throat> and as the market was constantly evolving, it became increasingly more difficult to price watches. And also, a second big part of it was uh, giving everybody a fair opportunity to bid and buy a piece that may be rare, it may be a perfect specimen or a great example that came by, and as opposed to putting it on the site at, at a price of, that, that may or may not be market again, it also gave people, the auction gives people an ample opportunity, in this case a seven day window, to go on, look at the watch, bid on it if they're interested in it, and it's more fair, it's more democratic, we love it. We launched it about three years ago. We built our own technology platform in-house, so we own it. So we're able to modify it as needed uh, as, as consumers react differently. And so we're constantly attuned to what consumers are looking for. Uh, so we love it. Uh, we noticed that Sotheby's and Christie's have also developed an online uh, auction platform. And I think it's going very, very well as, uh, as I can see. Uh, prices have been very, good as well uh, and some of these auctions that are taking place. I think, you know, the internet's about 20 years old now, Rob. And I think early on, consumers looking to spend, an ex you know, to buy an expensive item like a watch for ten dollars or $20,000 or even more in some cases online, it took a while. They had to get comfortable. Consumers had to get comfortable, uh, especially luxury consumers, which I believe we're sort of late later to the market to embrace the market and, and feel comfortable enough with buying an expensive thing online, uh, like a watch. And so I think that's come full circle now. And I, we're finally now, it's 2020, and I think people are comfortable. Watch buyers, they're comfortable going online, logging in, placing a bid, or buying a watch, hitting that buy button and buying a $40,000 watch, uh, you know, like, like this. And I think it, goes, it speaks a lot to the technology, uh, the trust that, that we've been able to build with the consumers uh, and customers out there in that market. So it's been fun. We love it. Uh, we want to keep running auctions once a month now with watches that have come in and being able to offer customers original timepieces that came directly from their original owners in most cases. Uh, so we're excited about it. I thought I thought it was interesting looking at the um, the fresh finds auction that you have going on this week, and I think it does it end in the middle of next week or the end of next week. Monday, Monday. So it's Monday. a one week auction. It started yesterday. It ends on Monday. Okay. So I mean, the the, the one of the beauties of auctions from a, a business point of view is that it 
it generates sales immediately. You can't you can't sit there and you don't have you don't have to wait. For, customers can wait a month or two months thinking they'll they'll buy it then. But with an auction, you've got to get in there. You've got to buy it now. Right, right. It's immediate. So again, um, I think the auction is a great idea. Not, not just because it was mine three years ago, but I think it gives everybody an ample opportunity. It lets people bid and take a particular watch. In this case, we've got 16 watches. We think we've priced them all about 20 to 30% below market. So there's an opportunity right now to get a real bargain. Uh, in addition, it gives uh, people a chance to buy a, a super rare collectible piece that maybe they've been looking for. Uh, but unlike some of the auction houses, the other auction houses, we don't charge a buyer's premium. We, we don't, it's not our sole business. We've already got the infrastructure here. So if you bid $20,000 on a watch, that's all you pay. Uh, there's no buyer's premium added, uh, no other costs involved. So we think we're always about bringing value to the marketplace and to consumers. And this is just one, one step in that same direction. And that, and that buyer's premium can be really significant. You know, 10% or something on a, on a $100,000 watch is, is a big uh, chunk of change. In some cases, it's 25%. So you take a $200,000 item like the Paul Newman, yeah. you add 25% onto that. It's $50,000 on top of that. And I think sophisticated, uh, avid buyers out there that are bidding on a $200,000 watch or a $100,000 watch, they are factoring in that 25% buyer's premium. And so that can be a, a, a you know, a stopgap for buyers because they're, they're not going to bid so much not, not to not include that 25%. So that all becomes part of the equation. Yeah. And one of the watches caught my eye was because I remember the story behind it was some somebody bought a secondhand sofa and found a, a Paul Newman Daytona wedged down the back of it. Is yeah. that right? Isn't that incredible? Yeah, <laughs> this, uh, the watch came out of Canada. Um, we uh, we were lucky enough to get the call from her. She had found it in the couch. She bought the couch for twenty five dollars. For those out there maybe that have not heard the story, uh, this lady bought a, a couch at a, a, a thrift store for $25 and four years later found a watch, a, this Paul Newman watch 16 in underneath the cushion of the couch when she was going to, to look for her iPhone that had fell, fallen down the crack. Uh, and so here we are, we're excited to have this watch. It's a 1970, uh, it's almost perfect. There's one loom plot that's just slightly flaking, uh, but it's a perfect watch. It's all original, uh, never been polished. It's cleaned, uh, and we're excited to bring it to auction. But we believe, Rob, it is possibly the second most famous uh, watch in the world. And everybody knows the famous Paul Newman, the most famous Paul Newman. That was Paul Newman's Paul Newman. It sold about four years ago or three years ago at auction for, I think, almost $18 million. But this is a pretty famous story because it was covered in the media quite a bit in the last year. And so we're excited to have the watch back again and to offer it up to the market. So I guess, I guess we'll find out. I mean, we all know that provenance is incredibly important when it comes to the, to the value of watches. You mentioned Paul Newman's own, own Daytona, but if it's owned by uh, no, Elvis Presley or a president of the United States or whatever, this, this adds interest and, and value. But would, would that particular story, which is just a sort of every man's story, would that actually add value in a provenance sense? I, I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out, I guess. Uh, I think so, yeah. I think it's uh, the couch, we call it the couch, Paul Newman, uh, as it's been referred to by others. But uh, we're excited. We think it's going uh, to do well. Mm. Tell, tell me a little bit about how you feel that the, the secondary market, the, the, the pre-owned, the grey market, I mean, let's talk about all these bits and pieces, grey market, black market, secondary market, pre-owned, vintage, all these sort of things. I mean, it used to be a complete and utter wild west, but it's seems to have become a, a great deal more sophisticated in in recent years and indeed um, significantly more um, embraced and welcomed and engaged with by by the Swiss watch industry itself how, how do you feel things have evolved in in recent years and how how might this lockdown this crisis impact things going forward 
Well, again, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, certainly we've all seen the migration to online little by little over the last five, 10 years. Uh, I think every dollar that gets spent online is a dollar that's not getting sped, spent on brick and mortar traditional retail. And that's been happening last five to 10 years. But I think this pandemic has really served to sort of accelerate it and push more. And what's gonna happen I think now is uh, it's uh, because of the pandemic and this other migration that was already in place, more and more consumers are feeling comfortable buying online. And I don't, I don't see that shift going back, Rob. I don't see that going back, backwards. It's only gonna keep going forward. And so I think the watch industry, the watch manufacturers, uh, everybody, they all need to find a way to embrace technology, embrace this change that's taking place in front of them. And pre-owned is a big, big part of it. Uh, pre-owned and online, they've got to find a way to participate in it, all the big brands, uh, because it's happening and there's no turning back. Uh, we think it's a good thing uh, in some respects. I mean, I, th I think that sooner or later, uh, a lot of these brick and mortar retailers, these authorized uh, dealers uh, for some of the big brands should start to sell online and develop an e-commerce presence so they too can participate in, uh, in this movement. Uh, but I, I think it's happening gradually. Things move slowly, Rob, uh, in that world. Uh, and I think sooner or later, they're going to embrace it and figure out a way to, to make the internet work in, the, in their operation. Uh, but I think the, uh, the things that are happening globally as well in Asia and Hong Kong and China uh, is also a, a big, you know, challenge for some of the, some of the brands. Uh, it's a big, big part of their business now. And what happens to that, you know, there's a political, you know, echo socio risk with doing business in Hong Kong and China and product that was earmarked for those, those territories can end up getting displaced elsewhere. Uh, and so they've got to factor that in as well. Uh, I think America is a very stable market. I think pre-owned is here to stay. Online obviously is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Um, and uh, as far as gray market, I think gray market's always been bad for the brands. Uh, I think the brands keep an eye on it. They try to, you know, mitigate it. They try to handle it as much as possible because Anytime you can go online and see a, a brand new watch selling for 20% off, 30% off, uh, and it's brand new again, it's, it's always bad for the brand. It always hurts the brand. And it certainly hurts the traditional authorized retail as well. It makes it much more difficult for them to sell at full price. I suppose it's, uh, ironically, it's one of, one of the things that uh, the pandeg pandemic has helped is that production has shut down. So rather than having three months of production for, you know, 100% production and nowhere to sell, sell these watches, at least we shouldn't see that massive flood um, onto, onto the grey market that would you know, do, do the sort of damage that you're talking about to the prices for the big brands. Um, but let me, yeah, let me ask That's going to be interesting to see, Rob, what's, what's going to happen. You know, is there going to be a massive amount of product? Because before the pandemic, as you know, predominantly with sport watches, Rolex and Paddock and some of the AP models, there was a shortage of supply worldwide for some of these models. And there were two and three and four and five year waiting lists to get some of these models like the Daytona or the Royal Oak uh, and the Nautilus. So what, what's going to happen now to this supply demand uh, equation that's sort of been taking place and demand has far exceeded supply for the last three, four, five years. Now you have this shutdown that takes place for three months. And I'm, I'm assuming there's probably going to be a, a gradual ramping up of production. I'm sure they're not just going to flip a switch and go right back to 100% capacity at Rolex, or AP, at Richemont, uh, LVMH, Swatch Group. So what's going to happen to supply? What's, we know demand is always there for the most part for these brands and the product. What's going to happen to supply? And if there's a constraint on supply, prices are going to just surge. I think it's a good time to buy, buy watches right now. I really do, given this well, supply to demand. I'll, I'll accept that you would say that, wouldn't you? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that. <laughs> never, never, never a bad time to buy, to buy watches. I, I really do.
I mean, going, going back to that, to that uh, e-commerce conversation, um, and I apologise for springing this on, on you somewhat, because, but I suspect you would have thought about it. You know, Rolex doesn't sell online at the moment, doesn't allow its authorised dealers to sell, to sell online. I mean, what would happen to the entire industry the day after Rolex says you can do e-commerce, or indeed Rolex.com will start doing e-commerce as, as Amiga has done? I, I think it would be I think it would be great. I really do. I think um, it, you know having product available online. Uh, there's always been a shortage of Rolex watches for the most part worldwide. Again, talking about that supply demand. I think Rolex is a little different uh, situation than some of the other brands and most of the other brands. Rolex has always been in short supply. Uh, they don't seem to want to increase production to meet you know that worldwide demand. Uh, like maybe Apple would or Nike would. Uh, Rolex, it's, look, it's a luxury product like Hermes's or, or Louis Vuitton. They don't want it plentiful everywhere anyways. It's not good for the product. It's not good for the image. So they want to keep production somewhat limited, but until they really ramp up production, they, they can't keep up with worldwide demand now. Putting product online uh, is going to possibly exasper exasperate the situation because there's just not enough product to go around. But I do see that when the day comes, when things sort of normalize and they do go online or allow their retailers to go online, I think it's a welcome addition. I think it's it's a natural. It's going to happen sooner or later. Yeah. I mean, one, one thing you and I might not entirely agree, uh, agree on is that I'm a, I'm a huge believer in, in the strength of a multi-brand, beautifully run, um, family owned oh, and indeed major multiple the, you know these when you're talking about Bucra, Watcher, Switzerland, London Jewelers, West Time you know who, whoever you're talking about these are phenomenally well run retail businesses that know how to bring people into a store know how to give them a great experience which is exactly what the, the Swiss watch brands want them to want them to be doing and I have a feeling that uh, They'll they'll adapt if if uh, if e-commerce becomes the thing, then they'll find a way of making e-commerce work for them as well. But I suspect that the that the retailers, rather than the manufacturers, will continue to be the best retailers. Well, the only the only thing I would say or add to that, Rob, I don't think you're you're wrong. The only thing I would add is that you know doing business online is a whole different operation than than you know in-store retail. Yes, a lot of these retailers are phenomenal. The stores are beautiful. The atmosphere is beautiful. They have trained staff. Uh, and it's a whole different atmosphere. And there are a lot of people that do want to walk in a store in that romantic feeling of looking at a watch and putting it on your wrist, talking to the salesman, perhaps looking at several different brands and several different models. You don't get that online. Uh, you're a little bit more sophisticated maybe online. You know what you want. Uh, we offer people a three-day uh, full refund so people get to order something online. A couple of clicks, comes in the mail the next day by FedEx. They have three days to keep the watch, wear the watch, make sure they like it uh, or get a full refund. But running an e-commerce business is completely different than running a, a traditional retail uh, and, and it's it, there's techno a lot of technology involved, much more so than obviously retail. Uh, but but it can be done, and and I think it's just inevitable before uh, most mostly some of the big retailers, like you mentioned, Watch Time and and some of the other big retailers. Tonneau's got a very big online presence. Uh, I think it's just a matter of time, no no pun intended, before the, before they all get uh, some kind of e-commerce operation, you know, going. Yeah, I mean, uh, Torno is doing phenomenally well with its with its pre-owned watches. I mean, that's probably, you know, that, that's probably its second biggest brand after after Rolex. And online, of course, it would be its its biggest brand. Um, I mean, what, one of the challenges for the for the authorized dealers uh, with e-commerce is that their their prices are fixed by the brands, whereas e-commerce players like uh, yourself or Watchfinder or or Chrono24 or eBay providing perfect transparency on on prices. So it means that if there is an oversupply of any product and insufficient demand, market forces immediately make that price 
drop uh, and the authorised dealer un uncompetitive. So it can be a very complicated world. It, it is, yes, it's complicated. You know, when we first launched about 10 years ago, we, we was typically selling watches below, 20, 30% below what retail would be. And we were all about value. We still are today, of course. But we were able to offer people a savings, saving 30% on a very expensive watch. Today now, you're right, market forces have taken over. And if that 116500 Rolex Daytona, uh, if the market wants to push that price today at 23000 that's where it's going to be. And if tomorrow or next month it's going to be twenty one, it's a constantly fluid marketplace that's going on. Unlike retail, where it's a set retail price, it comes from the manufacturer, and, and it really just becomes a, a supply uh, situation. Do I have that model or not? Customer comes walking in the store, they want to buy the 116500. Do I have it? Uh, we're in the second place, the second secondary market where we are, it's, it's market forces. You know, it's not just availability, uh, but it's also a, a very fluid marketplace in terms of price. And so we love it. We think it's fun. But if you go to one of the, the, uh, the websites you mentioned or even ours, you're going to be seeing products that are right at market. We very carefully for watches all right at market. Uh, and we have to stay in tune with that pricing that's always changing. Uh, and even 10 years ago, again, when we launched, uh, we would adjust prices maybe once a month, sometimes even once a quarter. But today we can maybe do it once a week, twice a week, depending on, on what's going on. So it's a much more robust, much, much more uh, liquid marketplace that's, uh, that's happening today. Yeah. And, and what, what are you seeing on, on the pricing side of things? And, uh, and by that, by that, I'd like to hear both the, the sell side, the sell price, and and the buy price, because I think towards the end of last year, the the spread was so narrow that you know there were very very slim margins on the Daytonas and the GMTs and the Nautiluses that you were talking about. Um, it seems to me that the sell prices have remained remarkably firm through through this pandemic. But I wonder whether the the buy prices from people like yourselves. Um, have been falling and giving yourself a slightly be a little bit more headroom on the margin side. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a good question. And um, I, I really believe that it's a good time to buy. And I, I say that because prices are down about 20%, 10 to 20% on diff depending on the model. Uh, and, and that's a good time because I don't think it's going to last. Uh, again, I think there's going to be a shortage of mostly Rolex watches, but sport watches in general because of the shutdowns that took place for a month or two. And I think that's going to play out in the market where prices are going to rebound because there's going to be a shortage of product. Uh, and so right now, we're seeing prices a little bit soft in some areas um, and we're pricing them accordingly. But on the, on the selling side, with customers selling to us, Rob, we're, we're not seeing the, the increased supply that we thought we would see. Uh, so there's no panic selling going on. There's not a lot of dumping that's going on. Uh, and so that's not helped offset the, the market pricing that, that's taking place now. So I think it's a good time to buy uh, because I do see prices going back up uh, shortly. Is the market somewhat frozen? I, I just the number of transactions has gone down so low that the prices wouldn't actually fluctuate as much. A little like the housing market. If nobody's buying or selling houses, there's not really much to point in talking about how much they're going up or they're going down by because nobody's actually completing a transaction. Have you seen that happen through this? Yeah, you know, Rob, we, we haven't. We, you know, yesterday we had a phenomenal Monday, like a typical Monday that we would have had like at, at Christmas. I can't wow. give you the specific numbers, but it was a a real busy day. We had a ton of watches go out uh, that had sold over the weekend. Uh, so we are not seeing, we, we feel like we're right back to normal where we were back in March before the pandemic. Uh, Amazing. And do you, do you uh, I, fi finally, do you, I mean, do you think that by the end of this year, you'll, you'll be back looking, you'll be looking back on a year that was up or down on 2019? Well, I hope so. If I get a little bit more coverage out of Watch Pro, maybe, uh, maybe that'll help mitigate some of the law. No, 
We, uh, we think when, when 2020 is all said and done, there will be at or slightly above where we were last year. We don't think it's going to be a, a big breakout year. We do think that there was a little bit of dip. But look, back in January, February, and March, the first quarter of this year, we were up 30% over last year. So we started out 2020 real strong uh, out of the gate. So, um, you know, March was down, uh, April was down, of course. Uh, May's down a little bit, but we see that it's rebounding. And so we think 2020 is going to end up strong. Great. Well, I, I, hope, I hope you're right. So we just... remain optimistic, of course. Well, I think, I think the, optimists, the optimists are always going to come out better than the pessimists. Um, yeah. On, on, the, on the way out of this crisis. You need, you need pessimism going in and you need optimism coming out, I think. There you go. I like that. <laughs> well, it's great yeah. talking to you, to you, Paul, and uh, thanks very much for your honesty and insight. It's always a, a brilliant conversation with you. Thanks, Rob. I love sharing ideas with you. Thanks. Thanks, Paul.